Welcome to our online services. We're glad you're joining us. Uh, just a reminder that we do have physical in-person services on our Four Mile property at 950 Four Mile Road Northeast. You can come and get out of your car, grab a lawn chair, uh, sit in the pavilion with us, or you can also stay in your car and listen over the radio. Also, beginning tomorrow, we're going to have those services on Facebook Live. So if you're on Facebook, you can turn in and tune in, sorry, not turn in, tune in and be a part of the whole service with the worship and everything else. Tomorrow will be Father's Day, so on that day, uh, we know it can be difficult for, for some that weren't able uh, to have kids, but we do know that's a special day uh, for those that, that have kids or have fathers. Uh, it can also be difficult for those who've lost their fathers, but, but we want to just say to the fathers, thank you for what you do. Um, and on Mother's Day and Father's Day, we give out gifts um, to different organizations. For Father's Day this year, we're going to be giving a gift to Urban Transformation Ministries, led by Joel Schaefer. And uh, hopefully you'll have a chance to hear from them about their ministry in the coming months. Uh, but they do a lot of awesome stuff here in Grand Rapids, and so it's a wonderful local ministry that we can support. So other than that, we look forward to uh, the sermon and a chance to dive into God's Word together, and I hope it's a blessing to you today. Today we continue our series called Urgency, the Life of Jesus and the Gospel of Mark. We've been walking through the Gospel of Mark. It's been a good journey. Back in 2012, just about a a little over a year after the earthquake happened in Port-au-Prince, Haiti, uh, I took a team of teenagers and and adults to Haiti uh, to do some work in an orphanage. And while we were there, I think we arrived on Saturday, and that Sunday we went to church. And I have to say it was one of the most amazing experiences I've, I've witnessed. Just so much joy and people dancing and clapping and, and worshiping with complete freedom. But one of the things that made me a little uh, nervous was during the offering time, instead of passing a plate, they played praise music and people danced down the aisles up to put their offering in the plate. And they would dance all the way down the aisles and they'd put it in and, and they'd cheer and, and dance and and it made me nervous for three reasons. Um, one, I, I can't dance, and so I felt really awkward trying to do that. Um, two, um, I felt like worried about how much to give, and, and if I gave too much, would they look at, oh, that rich uh, American? If I gave too little, why didn't he give that much? And there was this sense of, of feeling of what will people think of of what I put in. And so then the third, how am I gonna, how am I gonna put the money in in a way that they don't see how much I put in uh, because I don't want my giving to be in front of people but in front of the Lord. And so those were real valid concerns but on the flip side, one of the things I appreciated is they just had so much joy in their giving. So much joy in their giving. It was really a challenge to me as I thought about how I give. And at First Baptist, when I was a youth pastor, I had all of, our, all of our ties came directly right out of our check and went right into the account for the church. And so every Sunday as a plate came by, I would just pass the plate. So I always wanted to design a t-shirt. Last night I went online and designed one, something like this, where it would just say on the back, I gave online. So people know that when I pass the plate and don't give, that I, I was giving. You know, back in the old days, uh, very old days, the churches didn't have pews. People would stand, and so you actually had to buy a pew. And so when you came to church, there would be a name that would say, like, Phil Severin, and you, that was your pew because you actually bought it. And, and sometimes people would give big gifts to the church, and they want their name on it so that other people will know that they gave. And if you haven't caught it yet, to, today's message is going to be about giving. Now you may say, why preach about giving on Father's Day? That doesn't really make a lot of sense. Well, it's, it's really where we landed in Mark. We've been teaching about this upside-down kingdom that Jesus has been talking about, where the last is first, and, and where if you give up everything, you gain everything. And as we've been talking about that, part of what we realize is that this upside-down kingdom even relates to how we use our finances. 
So when we think of God's kingdom, it should affect every area of our life, even how we spend our money. Did you realize that the scriptures contain 500 verses on prayer, around 500 verses of prayer, less than 500 verses on the topic of faith, and yet over 2,000 verses on the issues of finance and your property. In fact, 16 out of 38, that's 42% of Jesus' parables, are about finances or money. One out of every seven verses in the New Testament, and one out of every six verses in the four Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, are about how we use our possessions and our finances. So while we go through the Gospel of Mark, we can't just skip over this thing that's mentioned time and time again. So before we dive in, let's pray and we'll dive into God's Word. Dear Heavenly Father, uh, Lord, we just thank you that uh, in your sovereignty you, you put the sermon where you put it. And uh, I don't know why it's this particular week or who needs to hear it, Lord, but we just thank you for an opportunity to open your word and allow it to speak to our hearts and minds today. Lord, use your word for your purposes. In your name we pray. Amen. To give you a little context, if you remember, we've been going through uh, the Gospel of Mark and those first eight chapters were really about who is Jesus, and these last eight chapters are about why did he come, and right now we're in the midst of the last week of Jesus' life. One pastor I was listening to estimated this to happen on Wednesday, two days before, I don't know exactly what day, but sometime between Sunday and Wednesday. Friday, this event is going to happen just before Jesus went to the cross. Now, if we rewind a little bit in Mark chapter 12 to give some context heading into this passage, we're going to start in verse 28. One of the teachers of the law came and heard them debating. Noticing that Jesus had given them a good answer, he asked him, Of all the commandments, which is the most important? The most important one answered Jesus is this, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Love the Lord your God with all of your heart, with all of your soul, with all your mind, with all your strength. The second is like this. Love your neighbor as yourself. There is no commandment greater than these. Well said, teacher, the man replied. You are right in saying that God is one and there is no other but him. To love him with all your heart, with all your understanding, with all your strength, and to love your neighbor as yourself is more important than all the burnt offerings and sacrifices. When Jesus saw that he had answered wisely, he said to him, You are not far from the kingdom of God. And then from, and from then on, no one dared to ask him any more questions. When Jesus was asked, what's the greatest commandment, he quoted the Shema from Deuteronomy 6. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. And he quoted that, he said, the second is like it, to love your neighbor as yourself. This encompasses all of the commandments. And here we have this teacher of the law who actually is one of the few examples of someone who got it. He said that that those things are more important than all the burnt offerings and sacrifices. So Jesus said to him, you are not far from the kingdom. We finally have a religious leader who gets it. But we'll soon find out that he was the exception, not the norm. Skipping ahead to verse 38. As he taught, Jesus said, watch out for the teachers of the law. These are the religious leaders. They like to walk around in flowing robes. And be greeted with respect in the marketplace and have the most important seats in the synagogue and the places of honor at banquets. They devour widows' houses and for a show make lengthy prayers. These men will be punished most severely. I mean, realize what he's saying is, look, they they dress nice. They, They demand respect wherever they go. They get the best seats in the synagogue. They get the best seats at the banquet. They do all these things for themselves. They, they, they say lengthy prayers while they're out in public so that other people notice their holiness. These men will be punished most severely. We transition right in from that to verse 41. Jesus sat down opposite the place where the offerings were put and watched the crowd putting their money into the temple treasury. 
Many rich people threw in large amounts, but a poor widow came and put in two very small copper coins worth only a few cents. Calling his disciples to him, Jesus said, Truly I tell you, this poor widow has put more into the treasury than all the others. They gave out of their wealth, but she, out of her poverty, put in everything, all she had to live on. Now historically, this this passage has been interpreted as a commendation of the widow, of putting the widow as the person that is a the example to follow. Now more recently in the, in the 90s and, 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 and more often now, it's often seen as uh, more of a, the widow is acting poorly. She isn't wise. And it's an example of that previous verse that said they devour widows' houses. And so much like the TV evangelists now that take advantage of those that are poor and tell them to send in the money, this is an example of the of the religious leaders taking advantage of widows. Now, I, I actually think from the overall context of Mark, of this idea of giving everything, I don't think that is the correct interpretation, but I just want to make you aware of it, and we'll show during this why I believe it's actually a commendation for this widow. So let's go over it verse by verse. Verse 41, Jesus sat down opposite the place where the offerings were put and watched the crowd putting their money into the temple treasury. You'll see from that picture, a picture of the temple, uh, that area there is called the women's courtyard or the courtyard of women was an area where women and men could go and worship. And in that area, they had 13 collection boxes, which are often called trumpets, because they were shaped like inverted horns. For the Mishnah, we learned that each trumpet was labeled so that you knew what you were giving toward. So new shekel dues, old shekel dues, bird offerings, young birds for the whole offering, wood, frankincense, gold for the mercy seat, and six trumpets for free will offerings. And because of the Passover, it would have been bustling with people, both local people and people from all over the world who came back to Jerusalem for Passover. So it would have been easy for Jesus to just sit back away from the crowd and watch, and people wouldn't have noticed what was going on. Then it says, many rich people threw in large amounts. Now, we shouldn't immediately assume that all the rich people had bad motives, but Jesus saw a lot that he didn't like. R. Kent Hughes says, the huge Passover crowds and public display made possible by the 13 trumpets combined to create some outrageous preening and prancing. We don't use those words very often, but he says, we can imagine that a hush came over the crowd when a notable person approached, perhaps with an offering too heavy to carry himself, and the audience gasped as the shekels crashed into the brass trumpets. Can you see their pious countenances? There, see if you can top that expressions. Now, if you've ever been to a coin star in, in Meyer and you put all the coins in, you hear them tink, 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 or even the, one of the best sounds back in the day before they had all these cards when you go to Chuck E. Cheese and you put $5 in, you hear all the tokens tink, 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 tink come out. It was so exciting. And then you put them in your pocket and your pants started falling down because it was so heavy. Not that that ever happened to me. But these brass. Uh, trumpets would make for that sound. So you have these rich people who are pouring coins into it, and that sound would be loud, and it would draw the attention of others. And everybody would look and look at how righteous they are. Look at how pious they are. Look at that big gift that they brought to the temple. But then verse 42 says, But a poor widow came and put in two very small copper coins worth only a few cents. Now, the NIV translates this a few cents because these copper coins were the smallest copper coins in, in Palestine at that time. In fact, you needed two of these coins to equal the smallest coin that was available in Roman uh, currency. And one of those Roman coins would have been 1 64th of a day's wage. 1 64th of a day's wage. Now, if you translate it over into America, we're a very rich nation, very rich economy, and so in comparison, even with our abundance that we have in America, this would still only be one or two dollars. 
So this, you, you imagine these extravagant gifts that are brought in and people are bringing these gifts and you hear the loud ching, ching, ching as the coins go down and this, this humble widow comes with two little coins and she just puts them in and, and with all the hustle and bustle, there's no sound made. No one would notice. Now, widows in those days were the poorest of the poor often. If they didn't have a son who would uh, take them under their wing, it was very difficult for women to earn, uh, to earn a livelihood in that time. And so there's no social security, you know, no welfare system. There was no way to make money, and so they would have been very poor. So verse 43, it says that Jesus, calling his disciples to him, Jesus said, Truly I tell you, this poor widow has put more into the treasury than all the others. They all gave out of their wealth, but she, out of her poverty, put in everything, all she had to live on. So in many opportunities throughout Mark, we see as Jesus sees a teachable moment, he grabs his disciples and he brings them in. And here he says, truly I tell you, that was a sign that what he was about to teach was important. And so, as he said, everyone else is impressed with these large gifts of the rich. But Jesus was impressed with this small gift. The widow is contrasted directly with the rich here, but she should also be contrasted with the religious leaders. Going back just to the previous verses, we saw that these religious leaders were were, were in flowing robes and greeted with respect in the workplaces and had the important seats in the synagogue and the places of honor at the banquets. These men will be punished most severely. You contrast that with this humble widow. It goes back to the idea of an upside-down kingdom. The, the widow put more into the treasury than others. Now, did she? Well, financially, absolutely not. In fact, if everyone in our church gave $1 to $2 each week, uh, we would have to let go of all of our staff. The temple couldn't survive on $1 to $2 on, on these two little coins if everybody decided to give that way. And yet, Jesus said she gave more than all the others. Now, their gifts would be long forgotten, but her gift will be written down in God's inspired word and remembered for all of eternity. They gave, it says, out of their wealth. But she, out of her poverty, put in everything, all she had to live on. She's living out the Shema that was quoted earlier in Mark 12. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, and mind. She's living it out. Seen through the gospel, we see that she's following the footsteps of the disciples who left their jobs, left their families, left their dreams, all to follow Jesus. One pastor I listened to two years ago um, when we were talking about giving said this. He said, there's a difference between emotional giving and devotional giving. Emotional giving and devotional giving. Emotional giving gives from the excess that we have. So we have the things that we need, and then out of that, if there's anything left, then we give. We give to causes we like. Then there's a need that tugs at our heart. We give to that. We give when we're comfortable, when we've paid all our bills, when we've put our money into retirement, we've got the car or the thing that we want. Emotional giving could also be self-righteous giving. We, we give out of obligation or hoping to have other people view us differently. Contrast that with devotional giving, which is giving to God first and living off of what is available after I've already given back to Him. Throughout the Bible, we consistently see the principle of giving God our first fruits, of giving to Him first before anything else. The principle of tithing is also all throughout the Scriptures, of of giving God this percentage off the front right back to Him. I heard an interesting thing that I never heard of, thought of this week, and it was that this, that giving of our finances is the only spiritual discipline we cannot fake. Listen to this quote. You can't fake stewardship. A person who has been a Christian for even a short while can fake prayer, Bible study, evangelism, going to church, and so on, but he can't fake what his checkbook 
reveals. You can't fake what his checkbook reveals. But then it brings the question, wasn't her giving reckless? Doesn't it make, she could have kept one of the coins for herself. Why did she give both? <coughs> Says she put in everything, all she had to live on. And that's one of the reasons why the commentators will say, well, maybe it's possible that this is just an example of the religious leaders devouring widows' houses. And so they would point to examples of these prosperity teachers on TV who would say, you know, if you send in $10, God will, God will you know, manifest that, and that will become $100. You send in $100, that will become $1,000. And they tell people to give, and if you give, then you'll be, be rewarded by God all the while while they're living in their mansions with their private jets and their Bentleys, living off of the money that they've tricked these poor people into giving. And while I believe that there is some merit to that, 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 that as Christians we aren't all called to sell everything and to give away everything and, and then to, to, to live off of nothing, you know, there is merit to pushing back against that idea. But in this passage... Jesus commends the widow for her example. He points to her as the one who has given the most. He points to her as an example to follow. You know, there was once a story about a restaurant. See, there was this chicken and a pig, and the chicken and the pig were talking to each other. And one day, the chicken decides that the two should start a restaurant. The pig is intrigued by the idea and says, That sounds great. I'm an entrepreneurial type of hog, I'm sick of working for the farmer. But what are we going to call the restaurant? The chicken thinks for a while and scratches and pecks at the dirt and says, ham and eggs. To which the pig replies, no thanks. I'd be committed. You'd only be involved. I'd be committed. You'd only be involved. See, the the chicken would just have to give the eggs, but the pig would have to give his very life for the ham. But yet, it seems like Mark is pointing to the example of the pig, of giving up everything. I believe there are examples of reckless giving that that point us to the the wisdom of it, in a sense. My grandfather, my great-grandfather, 99 years ago, started a canning company in central Pennsylvania. My grandfather took it, and my grandfather made a commitment from the very early years that he was going to give back 50% of everything he earned back to the Lord. And God blessed that canning company. Now, next year, they'll be celebrating 100 years, and they have around 300 employees, and they, they uh, support missionaries, and they give to good causes. And I believe a lot of that is tied to my grandfather's faithfulness of giving time and time again of what the Lord gave back to him. As a family, we've always tithed. Even when we figured out our budget, we realized that the money coming in wasn't going to equal the money coming out. We still felt it was important to tithe. I remember when I was a youth pastor in, in, in Philadelphia, and I had some of my friends. I was getting paid $50 a week as a youth pastor. And I was working usually 20 to 25 hours a week on top of my full-time job. And I had a couple people say, Phil, you don't need to tithe. Just tithe your time. Think about how much they should be paying you for those 20 to 25 hours. Just tithe your time. And I said, and we talked about it. I said, no, we believe firmly in this gift that we are called to tithe no matter what. And so while we were there between our full time jobs, our tithe was actually more than what we earned a week. So we paid the church to work there. But we just were so committed, saying, this is a biblical principle and we don't want to give up on it. And every time we've stepped out in faith and given sacrificially, God has always provided. Every single time. See, I firmly believe that giving is a lot more about our heart than the money that we give. Everybody spends money on something we love. If we love golf, we tend to buy golf clubs. If we, if we love to go to the beach, we tend to plan vacations to the beach. The things that we love, we tend to spend money on. So what is your posture to, towards giving? How do you think about giving? How do you, how do you frame it? What, when you make out your monthly budget, what part does giving back to God have in it? I think the two easiest ways to tell where your priorities are in life are how you spend your money and how you spend your time. 
Jesus said, where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. One commentary I read this week said this, where your heart is, there you will spend your treasure. The issue here is not how much they gave, but why they gave. I heard this quote this week, you can give a lot of money and have your heart in the wrong place, but you can't have your heart in the right place and give no money. Run that back. You can give a lot of money and have your heart in the wrong place, but you can't have your heart in the right place and give no money. Giving is about your heart. So maybe we all need a heart check, a heart evaluation. Are you giving in order to be blessed? Sometimes that's what these prosperity preachers will say. If if you give this, then God God will make it bigger. But Jesus said to pray, give us this day our daily bread. Sometimes we pray, God, give us our daily bread, our weekly bread, our monthly bread, our retirement bread, our just-in-case rain fund bread. But Jesus said, our daily bread. So God does promise to bless us, but that doesn't mean that he's going to make us rich. When you look at the early church, they they were beaten, they were thrown in jail, they were persecuted. It wasn't exactly the type of place that you would go for a quick, rich, yeah, a get rich quick scam. Struggling with words today. Second, are you given to impress others? Do you give because you want the status, because you want other people to look at you as a righteous person? Are you giving to God with a heart of holding or a heart of giving? A heart of holding says, this is my money, and so once I'm taken care of, then I'll give. A heart of giving said, God, this is your money. Everything I have is yours. And so I'm going to give freely from what you've given me back to you because it was never mine in the first place. See, heart of giving is a mindset. I believe that if you don't have a heart of giving when you have a few things, you probably won't have a heart of giving when you have many things. In our country, we're tremendously blessed, and we often lose sight of how blessed we are. 15% of people in the world live on less than $2 a day. 71% of people in the world live on less than $10 a day. Most of us will spend that between lunch and dinner just on food. A giving heart comes from a place where you recognize that everything you have is already God's. Your property, your money, every single piece of what you own is already God's and not yours, and therefore it is His to take from. I love this passage in 2 Corinthians 8, 5. And now, brothers and sisters, we want you to know about the grace that God has given the Macedonian churches. In the midst of a very severe trial, their overflowing joy and their extreme poverty welled up in rich generosity. For I testify that they gave as much as they were able, and even beyond their ability, entirely on their own, they urgently pleaded with us for the privilege of sharing in this service to the Lord's people. And they exceeded our expectations. They gave themselves, first of all, to the Lord, and then, by the will of God, also to us. I love that. They gave themselves, first of all, to the Lord. That was their first priority. And then they gave themselves to us. In the midst of immense trial, in the midst of immense persecution, in the midst of poverty, they gave generously. They didn't only give as much as they were able, they gave even beyond their ability. It's a kind of reckless giving I was talking about earlier. And they even pleaded with Paul for the privilege of sharing in this service of giving money to the church in Jerusalem who was experiencing hardship and needed help. They pleaded with Paul to allow them to participate in that. They wanted to help out. They gave out of their poverty, not out of their riches. When we think about this idea of giving, I think it goes beyond just the idea of finances. In fact, giving is the only place where God ever says to test him. To the Israelites, he says this in Malachi 3, For I, the Lord, do not change, therefore, O children of Jacob, are not consumed. From the days of your fathers you have turned aside from my statutes and have not kept them. Return to me, and I will return to you, says the Lord of hosts. But you say, how shall we return? Will man rob rob God? Yet you are robbing me. But you say, how have we robbed you? 
God's saying you're robbing me. They're going, well, what do you mean? How can, how can we rob God? How will we rob God? He says, in your tithes and contributions. You are cursed with a curse for you robbing me, the whole nation of you. Bring the full tithe into the storehouse that there may be food in my house. And thereby put me to the test, says the Lord of hosts. If I will not open the windows of heaven for you and pour down for you a blessing until there is no more need, I will rebuke the devourer for you so that you will not destroy the fruits of your soil and your vine in the field shall not fail to bear, says the Lord of hosts. Then all nations will call you blessed for you will be a land of delight, says the Lord. He says, test me. Bring your tithes and offerings into the temple. Fill my storehouses and see if I will not be faithful to you. Now, once again, from the New Testament, we can tell that God doesn't promise an easy life. And just because we give abundantly, that doesn't mean that God will return to us riches. But I firmly believe God will return to us blessings. That God will return to us confidence and peace, knowing that he will provide. (laughs) Proverbs 3, 9-10 says, Honor the Lord with your wealth, with the firstfruits of all your produce. Then your barns will be filled with plenty, And your vats will be bursting with new wine. Honor the Lord with the wealth and your first fruits. The very first before anything goes to anybody else. It goes to the Lord. So, where are your priorities? Where is your heart in relation to the time that you spend? How you use your talents? And even how you spend your money? See, I believe the widow's gift is a foreshadowing of Christ's gift. She gave all that he had, she had, and Christ here just a few days later was going to give all that he had for our benefit. In fact, he asks us to do the same. Earlier in Mark, Jesus said this, then he called the crowd to him along with his disciples and said, whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves, take up the cross, and follow me. Whoever wants to save their life will lose it, but whoever loses their life for me and for the gospel We'll save it. What's become completely evident as we've walked through the gospel of Mark is that Jesus calls us to put him first, to pursue him first, to seek him, to seek his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these other things will be added to us on wealth. That we're to lay down our life, that we're to deny our selfish nature, that we're to take up our cross and follow Christ, that we're to give everything to the God that gave everything up for us. We were laid down our own lives. And this humble widow, in a simple act of bringing two small coins, demonstrated the life lived for God. We love the Lord our God with our heart, soul, mind, and strength, and love our neighbors as ourselves. So may we be people that honor God with every aspect of our life, including our finances. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you that you are so gracious to us, that even when we fail in this area, there is grace. Lord, help us to reorient our thinking, to prioritize you in the finances we have, but not only in that area of our life, but in every area of our life, that we lay down our rights and pursue you first, that we seek first your kingdom and your righteousness, and know that you'll take care of all the other things that we have on this earth. You'll take care of providing for our needs. Lord, help us to be reckless in our giving, to give abundantly and joyfully and thankfully, knowing that you will provide. Lord, we love you and praise you today. In your name we pray. Amen. Well, thanks for joining us online. We hope that this sermon was an encouragement to you. And hope to see you again soon. Have a great week.